for, for those who are, uh, were attending the, the first morning session, it mirrors the, the pattern of the morning session in that Zeynep's work is quite focused on understanding the potential of a type. Uh, and the the the, uh, the complexities that were perhaps found, as Chris, you put it, in, in Ray's work are uh, very underplayed uh, in, in Zeynep's work. But we might sort of say that there's a different kind of discovery, and that is in the potential of a building that we might spot in one location, in one condition, one country, and begin to ask, what does the diagram teach us that might be redeployed in a very different kind of context, um, but where there are certain sort of similarities of reasoning. So she's taking a building based in Berlin in the heart of the city that is about uh, sort of healing a, a, a fabric that has uh, got a very loose, uh, loose grain and and, um, and fairly large buildings and then starting to look at, well, where else do we see that? And sometimes it's on the periphery and can we make a building perform in, in some ways uh, commensurately on the periphery? So uh, Zeynep's going to take us out to the Lee Valley and uh, we're going to look at a problem of an uh, area near a kind of employment lands along the Lee. Thanks. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, so I'll be presenting my thesis project, which is Imagining a Resilient Community Where We Work, Produce, Learn and Live. Here in this image, we can see that we use our ends on a daily basis when we're cooking, when we're working on a computer, when we're reading, or even kids use when they're playing with the toys. But we, in the, the manual arts, we actually use our hands to produce things. And we don't actually think of these two different concepts being in close proximity as it is in here to each other. But as Richard Sennett argues, as much as we learn to do things physically by our hands, we actually learn how to tune with others and how to be in, in us, to create the civic coherence within the community. So what if we explore, um, a, explore a diagram of a, a type that will kind of allow us to think of that integration? Um, how, what kind of a project we can um, imagine if we kind of bring the, the spaces of production and manual arts into our living environments? And, and then in an interesting area to work on uh, in a project like this is the Lee Valley and is a peripheral condition where we can see the already existing like industrial buildings located along the, the valley, uh, which is actually uh, becoming a growing armature along um, the railway. But then we see these terrace houses uh, kind of on the both sides of the, the valley, which are, which are already not in relation with, there is no relation between the, these the industrial buildings and the residential buildings, but they, are, they don't have any interactivity. So, sorry. Um, but we can see that in the area, there are already things that are, there are already activities, industrial activities. People already make things here, but, uh, and there is the residential areas, but what we don't really see is actually how we can bring those two different concepts and two different uh, activities and bring them close to each other so that we can talk about the advantages that it will bring to our living environments. And, uh, and if we look at the, the urban fabric of the area, we see the dominate, domination of the, the big but light industrial buildings and then we see the sea of terrace houses that are kind of having two different conversations uh, within each other but not really interacting. So what if we take that linearity in the diagram and then kind of try to have this concept of shears and rotations and um, shears rotations and uh, these kind of uh, crossovers between the, the linear lines and then maybe we can have different patterns that will create associational relations within the building things. 
so that maybe we imagine a project uh, where it mediates between the two different conditions where the the line, the street lines where it defines the terrace houses and these these buildings which are kind of located with a coarse grain and what happens if you kind of take that diagram of sheared grid and then kind of create these um, these spaces of parks, yards and where, where the buildings are kind of grouped around it. And there is a very interesting exemplar in Berlin, the, the building EBAP, uh, kind of doing that in the heart of the city, where there, which is located in a previously industrial area. But the, what's interesting about this project is it kind of uh, doesn't really respond to the existing street lines, but it kind of works with the idea of having parks and spaces around the building that will kind of uh, create different lines of circulation uh, within and outside the building. And it has to do with the, with the diagram of the type. And what is very interesting is as the building elongates, uh, the decision of creating, uh, having the circulatory system on the two ends create this conceptual segmentation of the building so that the middle is different than the two ends. And that kind of gives a, an interesting uh, further step to discuss what happens if the dimensional uh, or the orientational uh, characteristics of these two ends are kind of uh, changes as they get larger or subtracted. The similar segmentation is valid on the middle part of the building, where the ground acts a little bit differently than the upper levels. And the ground, the, the units that run uh, along the floor plate kind of allows you to move through the building. So it creates two different um, circulatory, um, the lines of circulation that kind of goes through the building and and the, the ones that goes around the building, which is part of the city. But on the upper floors, the, the corridor is kind of, uh, the corridor is the, the main circulatory system, which it tends to become more than just a, cir a circulatory armature. So what if we take that diagram and kind of take it into a further point where maybe we can start the Take, we can start to take the idea of making uh, to, um, to create a different culture of lifelong laborliness and multi-generational habits uh, so that we can have crossovers between skill development and manual arts and how that type di diagram would help us to do that. Because it is because it bringing manual arts into our living environments doesn't only mean to be in, cro in close relation to our working environments, but it's also about the fact that we actually learn by doing things. So if we bring that to, into domestic lives, we can actually imagine that multi-generational uh, learning and skill um, development uh, in our domestic environments. So as I mentioned, if we take that diagram and then if we kind of aim to have these different uh, spaces, varied, varied spaces within the building, we need to look at the variations uh, of the dwelling units. And the, so here we can actually see different variations of units that they explore to what extent these, uh, the domestic environment and the work the production could be uh, um, integrated to our lives, daily lives. Here is a typical floor plan where we can see that the middle is, uh, is the different than the two ends. And actually two ends are also different in terms of direction and uh, dimension. So there is the, the corridor and the, the, the middle which runs along the the. The, the middle part and then the, the ends actually expands on the two sides, creating different kind of spaces on the, the both ends. So as we start to look at the, the middle part, uh, we can actually try to, um, we can try to explore what happens if the circulatory space was not just a circulatory space, but some of the activities, some of the 
the things that are happening inside the unit might be taken out so that it becomes more than just a corridor. It could become uh, a space where, which is shared by the residents for uh, like a atelier, potter atelier, used by the residents living on the same floor play, so that we can have, we can create these double height spaces within the unit, which is just about the life of the, the daily life of the, the residents. So that these pockets that are created, like the extension of the circulatory space, gets different characters. Uh, if we get rid of the, the kitchen, then it, on, on some floor plates, they become actually the, the shared kitchens. Or sometimes they become like these uh, little uh, workshop spaces. Oops, sorry. So as the building gets deeper, the, the, the part and then the back of the, the northern side of the building kind of goes up and then wraps around the circulatory space and gets deeper. And as it gets deeper, then we might try to, we might think of different ways of uh, arrangements in the units where the, the, the co-living could be another option where the gradation of lighting kind of creates differentiation within the space, not just like a the kitchen or the bedrooms, but spaces of storage spaces where there may be a cinema room could be brought into the unit. So it becomes a richer um, residential diagram. Or even taking the dimension of a workshop space, which are kind of located around the area. What if we bring those kind of dimensions into the building? What happens if we kind of take advantage of bringing them into the building what, uh, and kind of use it as a tool of providing wider benefits to the, the surrounding um, the residents. And as we look at the section of that part of the building, it is not just another large space as part of it, which is used by the residents, but it's all also creating these spaces that could be actually used for the farmer's market or the, the skill training uh, workshop spaces. So the building actually kind of trying to open up and give a wider urban benefits to not just to the residents, but to the surrounding. And as we look at, as we move to the ground floor, I'd like to take your focus to the middle part again, where we have the, we, we have the residential units only in, uh, on the ground floor, only in the middle part. But because this is an interesting scheme in terms of having a lot of variations in the unit, it, they are kind of uh, triple height units where, we, where it could be explored in terms of in wh what ways we can take our workshop spaces or workspaces into our uh, residential units. And, what it might create in terms of differentiation in the two sides of the, the building. It could be, uh, we might think of having a workshop which is more related with the back side of the, the building where the, actually the, the, it for, uh, performs as a yard and the serves circulatory, uh, or it could be more in relation to the life of the building where it kind of combines with the kitchen so that it kind of spills out to the, to the garden in front of the, the unit. So the, the linearity of the building, the elongation of the building kind of creates this differentiation on the both sides of the building, the back side and the front side. With that we can create, we can have the, the servicing uh, go, uh, is provided at the same time we can have a civic environment in front of the building where um, a communal garden and a, uh, a communal garden is kind of um, provided to the, the area. And we, as we zoom out, um, so the, the differentiations in the circulation and the circulation lines within and outside the building uh, might have different lines of uh, relation with the the surrounding buildings and and which are which are pretty related with what's going on within the type and how it's relate to its its sites. 
so that these different lines of circulation creates different uh, spaces within the assemblage. And we might imagine that the buildings do, do not respond to the existing street line, but they actually uh, grouped around parks, yards, and gardens. And the idea of assemblage is not only interesting in terms of how these buildings come together, but in terms of how it opens up and how it's related to the wider area. We can actually use the assemblage as a way to build a platform that will kind of connect the area of the 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 the, the residential area and the, those resources on the other side of the the railway because over right now the railway is kind of acting like a border in the area it's separating the, the marshland and the water courses from the the residential areas but an idea of assemblage and the use of platforms and these different levels could actually help us to bring and um, like take these resources towards the uh, into the project and then help for a, a more connected uh, environment for the future of the area so that we don't have these kind of uh, towers like in Tottenham Hill but we might have more like a project that will mediate between the mediate the between the the existing the production that's going on and the, the the residential buildings that are already there so that it will kind of um, have a sense of purpose rather than just creating numbers uh, and building more and more in the in the area as it is right now thank you so much thank you Thank you very much. That was really refreshing, actually, to see. Um, I've been trying to do this for the last 30 years and haven't succeeded. <laughs> but it's amazing to see it in, in this environment of how, how right it seems somehow to actually think in this way rather than total segregation of uses and functions. And if you can actually create a mixed-use environment that allows different ways of living but also working you know, ne next to it. I, I think it's really accomplished scheme. I, I, I couldn't help feeling though about all the, all the hurdles that would be in the way of realization. And I think that's why I find it refreshing in, in a lot of ways because it's very utopian. Uh, it's got a nice airiness and campus to it. And I, I, I'll just have to sort of uh, commend you really on, on the clarity of thinking as well within it. There's, there's not a lot that you that you can sort of say isn't working really well in terms of the resolution of the plan, the cross-sectional typologies, and they're all really ambitious moves that you're, you're putting in there. Um, it, it, it is so utopian, though, in a way. It's sort of like you need the right community. It's almost like if this was a campus or Black Rock College or... I don't know. I don't know how close we are to being able to do this. It's the sort of things that Google and Apple should be funding and paying for and getting getting to work really. Um, but so that leads me on to my questions of sort of who do you think would live in these communities? Would it be uh, normal, ordinary families, or are you are you aiming for a certain type of maker? Um, make a resident. I mean, who would, it, who would it attract, I think, is kind of interesting. We've we just finished a, a site where we've brought in quite a lot of fashion and textile makers and craftspeople and things in a residential scheme. But it, it's completely segregated in many ways. It's sort of divided horizontally. And what, what's interesting about your scheme is you're mixing the program vertically. And that brings all sorts of problems as well. But it, it actually is really interesting to see that your bookends that go up um, have that program going all the way vertically and the residential's going up and it's sort of slightly morphing as you go to different levels, different types of uses and then you've got the high level communal spaces as well. I, d I just think it's very rich actually, the whole, the whole program. But it, it would be interesting to think about does it need like massive community funding and, and you know, in order to realise the program, would you need a very specific, sp particular and specific set of economic and social 
criteria to back it up? Is it, is it, or is it, you know, I think it works as an architectural proposition. It, it feels really fantastic. And as I say, it's something we've been trying to, try to achieve. So I, I, I think it's really interesting. I think on some levels, um, you sort of cracked it really early on in the simple move, and then the more you worked into it, somehow it was maybe getting a little bit too complicated with that. I, I, I wasn't 100% convinced about the central corridor space, and I just wonder whether it would be stronger if it was just a residential core only in the, in the middle. I, I think that cross-section could get very, that one could get very complicated to achieve. And you've got enough going on at both ends, I think, mm -hmm. um, to, to deal with the the making and the industry. I, I think what we get a lot is, is from people, you know, planning authorities, is trying to segregate and make clear lines of division. Mm -hmm. and, it, and everybody's trying to get the, to, the, um, the, the, the classic live work to, to work, where you meld the two together, which is what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But I, I just think your scheme might be stronger if you just accept that in the middle it's probably more orientated towards residential. Mm -hmm and the two bookends of where the industry happens. I don't know, it's just, mm -hmm. it just seems to get very, very ambitious in that central section, whereas the original diagram was very simple. But I, I, I think it's fantastic, a really refreshing scheme to see. The graphics are super light and airy, very, there's a very simple 1950s modernist optimism about the, the, the plans and things. And the reference images, I think, are, are all, all relevant. Sometimes you see reference images and you say, well, God, why, why is that there? You know, why have you used that reference? And, and I think it's, I think there's a lot, a real lot going for it. But particularly as I think it, it just hits a sort of area of activity that I'm personally very interested in. So I'm, I'm probably picking up stuff that isn't even in there. I don't know. But it, 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 I, I thought it was great. Yeah, really good. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so that'd be great. I, I agree with Graham. I think I think it's a really lovely project actually. And um, I thought that also the again the balance of your your hand drawings and and the, and the delicacy and the, the the joy in the section, the optimism I guess is the word to use, is that hand drawings you know hand drawings are so good because you know there's nothing in the way. You know if you've, it's just an extension of you right on the page and your opening shot, which was your sketch, was was beautiful and. Uh, and reinforced further into the presentation. So congrats on that, that's, con that's to be commended. Um, I, I agree with that there's this thought that where, where the work is coincident on, on, on the section, i.e. in the same, on the same level, that could be interesting. It could also be, you know, problematic. Mm -hmm. There's the whole issue of goods going in and out and all of the noise, and there's loads of kind of things that, that w would need to resolve there. But the other thing I suppose is, and it's not a criticism, it's just it's an observation that the, the scheme is quite sort of introspective and it's a sort of self-contained system, you know, mm -hmm. which is fine. It would be good to see how it connected or dealt with its interfaces in its context a bit more, I think. Yeah. I think that would, now, you could say, and in the, in the last slide you showed that there was lots of white space. Mm -hmm. There's the map building, and then there's the space around it. Mm -hmm. And the extension of that would be, if it is a self-contained system, to have produced, have, things would grow, you know, yeah. that you might actually use to make things, or there would be an extension of that system that covers the whole region. And then in that, then you start to address the fringes of the scheme, which I think are a yeah. bit not really dealt with. And that would be the next bit of work that you would do yeah. would be to address that. That's my sort of simplistic take on it, but it's, it's really good to see. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I, I mirror all, all the comments as uh, it's really appreciated. Um, so maybe I'll just start with what I found curious and, and what, what I think perhaps the project could be. Mm -hmm. um, don't get me wrong, I think it's amazing, right? What, what you've produced, a resolution, I think as Larry has said, it's not expected, but it's, it will be delightful to get it in such a short time and you have reached there. Mm -hmm. So I congratulate you on that. My, where I found curious is um, why the precedent that you chose and why do you put so much importance in that precedent? Because I felt that what the president show you is essentially a, dumb, a dumbbell diagram. It's your classic dumbbell diagram where you have two anchor points at the at two ends and you connect them. The two dumbbells holds the most 
intense program usually, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have most congregational people and then between them, slightly less and they are more segmented and more granular in mm -hmm. between them. And the challenge is therefore, how do we connect those mm -hmm. circulation? And rightly so, on the ground floor, because you can access it from two ends, you do not need a central corridor. Yeah. The above, you need to segment them and they need a central corridor. Mm -hmm. But I think where the questions and I think the potential in which your question I think raises, I think lies somewhere else, I think, right? Mm -hmm. You can completely disagree with me, right? So um, I think to me, the question is really what architects, uh, especially I think here, British architects have been wrestling with in the 60s and 70s, is really about the way in which we move from the street to your front door and the way in which we think about dwelling and in that movement from the street to your front door, what are the possibilities that can happen? What are the elements of the city, whether it is work, whether it is social space, that we could draw into this? Mm -hmm. And immediately I think about the projects that great architects have been grappling with, Smithsons and their street in the sky, Dennis Larson and interpreting the two up, two down in traffic, uh, in, oh, where's, it's, it's just next to Columbia Market. Uh, it's, it's a high rise uh, that, that in which he really wanted to create a two, a, the two up, two down, but in the form of a tall building, mm -hmm. right? So, Keating House, exactly, exactly that. So, but the pre preoccupation is the same. It's essentially how can we think of the quintessential terrace house or the semi D, but in a higher density. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where your project, I think, is can, in a sense, be read as attempting to do. The units above are, in a sense, a much more refined version of street in the sky, of Smithson's street in the sky. Because what Smithson forgets about the street in the sky is that the street is always activated by workspace or by shops, mm -hmm. whereas their street in the sky is just a corridor. But what you have done is essentially creating a corridor that is partially perforated and partially activated mm -hmm. by social space, by workspace. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes slightly further than what Smithson has already done. Mm -hmm. And then on the ground floor where I begin to see some remnants, if you were to draw a larger site plan, mm -hmm. you would see that the regulating structure that is continuous, that is unrelenting, is not too dissimilar from the structure of a terrace house, right? And I think there is a potential there to draw upon that dialogue between this kind of condition with mm -hmm. that condition on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that discussion, I think, would be far richer than the question of the dumbbell, right? Mm -hmm. So I think then it raises different questions, yeah? Now, the other thing that I find curious also, if you go back to your ground floor, mm. right? If you see, in a way, the most public, or in a way, the most potential where we could inject public program, we allow circulation to be more public, to be more seen, is on the ground floor. But what I found curious is that where that potential could be had, is where you actually remove them and create a walled garden. I assume that's a low wall or a, right? That's a retaining wall. Yeah, and in that sense, I think it also misses an opportunity, right? Especially when you have two dumbbells here, this is a large space that will draw a lot of attention, a lot of co a community program. Why do we make this so private in a way? Yeah, so I think if we begin to think about and ponder about the kind of struggles that Smithson, that Dennis Larson, Leslie Martin has, has been grappling with, right? How do we think about the quintessential terrace house? Uh, it's, it's regularity and in that sense is uh, the public nature of housing, right? Mm -hmm. How could we think through that, right? In regards to from street to your front door, mm -hmm. what happens? And what are the structures, what are the irreducible structure, the diagrams that enable that, I think could enrich what you have already done. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. I, I think I've got some broader questions and maybe comments because it's a, it's a lovely project. I think, again, it addresses some of the issues of work live that we've been, I remember dealing with as a student. And um, it also, it has a little bit of Le Corbusier in it. It has, to me, a little bit of Nakafim. Um, 
And you kind of think, okay, these questions and these typologies have been going on for quite some time. And there's a question as to why why Graham can't make it work in the UK, <laughs> why some of these things have been tried and then forgotten. And then there's a broader question, you know, as you're kind of postgraduate students in the oldest postgraduate program at the AA, to what extent is there a, a legacy of knowledge about these typologies and where they've risen and fallen and the kinds of lessons that have been learned by Dennis Laston, by Neve Brown, by any of these, these people who've come quite, who are now dead. You know, so to what extent, why are we repeating these typologies? Mm-hmm. And to what extent, and someone said to me upstairs, you know, is these, this should be the most, the biggest innovations in housing should be coming out of housing and urbanism. And to what extent is that true? And to what extent should that be true? I think that's a very important question. To what extent are you using these design experiments as a way of conducting research? And what are the objectives and the outcomes of that research? Mm-hmm. I think that's something, co- this goes for all of you. This is, it just comes up in yours because also the way in which you're drawing has a slightly kind of mid 20th century aspect to it, which is beautiful and wonderful. So how do we live differently? Our domestic environment is different. The nature of making is different. Um, when we make it a variety of different scales and perhaps there's a different way of understanding domesticity and the work environment, particularly post-COVID, in quite a radically alternative way. The biggest clue for me was in that early drawing about your hand drawing with people using their hands in different ways. Mm. Because I think one of the big differences in the problems for live work in the current environment is that we assume that living is private and working is public. Most people, at least particularly during COVID and a lot of people here, may work at a kitchen table. Mm-hmm. You, a lot of people conduct their work life within an entirely domestic environment that becomes public by the introduction of strangers to that environment and a professional capacity or a professional aspect to that uh, interaction or that relationship. But it's a modulation rather than a division. Mm-hmm. And so we tend to associate then the double height space becomes public, but is it private? To what extent are we really talking about a different use of hands from the computer to the kitchen to a workshop to holding a child? How do we use our hands and how does that become quite a layered relationship between public and private and therefore between live and work and therefore a much more varied relationship between um, inside and outside, ceiling heights, et cetera. And I thought the other clue was in your diagram, which was almost becoming a map building, where you have the slippages between. It was just kind of a little Mm. weave of lines that was your way of also interpreting the site that left opportunities for movement between, um, I suppose, between the pattern of the terrace house, between the pattern of the landscape, that perhaps maybe could end up with something less specifically contained within the block of housing um, that offers opportunities to look at yet another quite old fashioned (laughs) typology, which is the mat building and all the stuff that was done by, by the Smithsons or recorded by the Smithsons from going back to Berlin and the free university. So how do we look forward since we've looked at this problem of live work over and over again for a long time, Mm -hmm. we've looked at the interrelation between housing components that involve um, a kind of maisonette arrangement. What are we bringing to the conversation that's different and how do we use these design experiments to try something new? Mm -hmm. The way we live hasn't changed tremendously, but it's changed very, very gradually. We're evolving different modes of, be that different forms of domestic environment, different forms of family life, different economic needs, because uh, students and young people find it very difficult to live within kind of inner urban environments. What does this tell us about new possibilities? And how do we find the tools to make a new architecture out of that? And for me, I think maybe it's taking that early clue of, of what you do with your hands. How many things can you do with your hands? And what are the spaces that you do with them? From, you know, the tiny cupboard to you know, the bathroom, I suppose, but um, um, through to something much more shared and generic. Um, because what you do on your own with your hands and what you do with other people, be that another person or 50 other people, yeah. like clapping. You know, there's so many different contexts that one could frame this would give you a, perhaps a different way in. Yeah. Thank you. In, in the, the failure of housing, um, <laughs> the, I, 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 I agree with, with what you were saying about look at the other precedents, the streets and the skies and things, but equally, I, I think 
it could go both ways in your scheme. You could make the residential component more public because there's a lot of public activity around, or you could close it down and make it purely residential. And that, that was the sort of question I was asking really about that central block. And I, I think it did become more problematic when you try to make it a street in the sky because when you put other functions in those corridors, they have to, have to work. And if, if those functions fail, then the whole concept fails. Some streets in the sky do work. I think Alexander Road works, and, and there's a Maiden Lane estate by Neve Brown, which a friend of mine lives on, which is hugely successful. And it's quite low rise, but it, it, it does work. But it's getting the balance right. And I, and I think it's, it's not an either or or a yes or no question. It's not black and white. I think, I think it's just a case of it's, it's either one thing or another, and both work, but you have to make sure that you have the components in each to make them work. I don't think I've described that very well, but I, th I think the worst is when you try and, com and, and combine the two functions for residential, I think, where you, and then one part of that component fails. Whereas if you, if you just keep it really simple, and I think I agree with Chris, the, the bookends, the dumbbells, they, they just take care of themselves. There's so many possibilities from market uses, I think you had in some areas, and then you had um, uh, maker spaces and various other things. They, they, they have taken care of themselves. And the thesis of the project is that middle section, I, I agree. But I, I do think it's more complex than it could be a street in the sky or not. I, th I think it could, it could be a lot of different things. And I saw you had the super loft as a reference as well mm -hmm. in the, the, the Dutch examples. Um, so I, 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 I think I totally agree that the thesis of your project is, is that central section and the public interface. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to make it more public. You can make it more private. Both, both work, I think. And, and I think you could probably do another project next year, if you fancied it, to, to explore that, that, that dialogue of what the residential component in a scheme like this could be. Mm -hmm. But it's a, big, it's a big, big subject. And people have been grappling with it for, for, for ages, really. But it is very nuanced. And it's, it, it relies on a particular set of circumstances. You know, why did Trellick Tower work, but the one over at the East End fail, for example? What, what, there's lots of other factors that make a, the architectural program work or, or not. But, but, it, but I, I agree totally that the, the central bit was the, the more fascinating part of the project, I think, in a way. Um, so maybe you just need to drive it one way or the other to close this off and then maybe look at it differently in the next project. I don't know. Interesting, though. Dan, do you, do you have well, just, I just want to pick up one thing, actually, that talking about. Um, yeah, so Graham, you're talking about, I mean, it's something that we found out in when we contributed to something called Places of the Work, is that actually it's critical knowing where you are in London to actually how you might look at viability. So the research that was done by Architecture Zero Zero and us was that, in a sense that whether you're North London, South London, East London or West London, you'd actually have to have a different response. And it's something obviously that hasn't been really raised within the work, but it could be something that's speculated upon, you know, how would this change actually in a different part of a metropolis as large as London? Yeah, not, not this week. It will be done this week. Sorry. I think in terms of housing and urbanism, I think the housing has been, you've been grappling with it. The urbanism side of it, in terms of how the scheme sits in its context, is work, still work to be done, I think, which will make it a richer project. I think there's still that for me. There's a void kind of in the way it interacts with its um, hmm. With its, uh, with its context that I don't really understand right now, and I think that would enrich it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you need to just give it a more specific context. Okay. Maybe, maybe the Lee Valley is too open. Maybe you need to okay. try to shove this in Camden or somewhere. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure whether it's a greenfield site or it's a brown yeah, exactly. or what, what, what exactly, exactly. is. It's wrapped around it. Well, 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 okay. Yeah. 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 The International uh, University of Berlin, the Tree University in Berlin, mm -hmm. they did a little diagram before that. Let's check that because it's restricted. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it does. It does feel like a campus at the moment, the way you've mm -hmm. you've drawn it. So it did remind me of the there's a building called the Free University in Berlin, which is arranged around a series of courtyards, very low pancake type mm -hmm. building that just expanded yeah. into its context, a little bit like uh, ETH does. You know, mm -hmm. sort of move around. Uh, but I, 
Yeah, I mean, it almost feels like you could spend the next three years doing different iterations of this and just moving it around the city to different <laughs> locations. Thank you. Steve, yeah. Um, just to go expand on what Lee, you were saying about the context and what might help, is that um, <clears throat> you can see just across the river, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of larger built forms in a cluster, almost kind of triangular. Well, there's, there's some new and old examples of buildings that are combining residential and workspace. Some are kind of reconfigured, almost informal. Mm -hmm. Some have got new planning applications and so on. There you can see the kind of difficulties that you have with Hackney Council mm -hmm. in respect to policy regulation and trying to get that, that right number of residential and um, commercial workspace as well. So there's some clues around which I think should help. Thank you. Well, like what degree of reality are you dealing with? Because to a certain extent, you know, this is a type of, it introduces a typological project. And therefore it, it depends less on its context and less on policy. Um, in which case you kind of have to go all in and demonstrate a fantastic knowledge of those typological precedents and really interrogate them hard and what they mean within the patterns that they establish and what the patterns that we read from them. I think then there's a larger question across all the projects you know, are you building in 2024 with current London councils, or are you thinking more abstractly about the nature of domesticity and the urban environment? Well, I think the answer is much more the latter. Um, and the, the, I don't think that that precludes the thought that it poses questions which may not necessarily be answered in each student's thesis, but it poses the question for exactly these kinds of conversations where we want to bring people together who are from the wider field and talk about these things in a way that feeds back to, to the city and to the practice. Um, but just to, to come back to some of these points, in, in, a, in a way, um, Zainab began with a ridiculously utopian and um, and um, uh, and ambitious idea that we were going to make a new Barbican on the Lee, and uh, and then for a variety of reasons, all of the questions about the type became so, uh, in a way, absorbing that it scaled scaled in, scaled in, scaled in, and and what you're seeing in the sense is the the trace of that utopian idea um, kind of left uh, as the surrounding landscape and it, it didn't quite get resolved. And, it, and in a way that was partly our fault because we got interested in the possibility of shifting from the scale of what we might call an assemblage to the scale of something we might call a complex that say, if you get to the, the size of the Barbican, what can you do differently that you can't do when you're only dealing with, uh, with, with two, to, two to four hectares? And so for, for I think what happened is that in, in Zainab's case, there was a combination of um, the, the overwhelming challenge of trying to reinvent the Barbican that led to a sort of paralysis uh, and you know, falling back onto the questions of the type to such a degree that it was hard to come back out. And that was probably partly our fault that we let that conversation go on for too long. Uh, but at the same time, I think we, we actually, as a program, learned quite a bit in terms of how to see the interrelationship between the assemblage size and the complex size. And so a lot of the conversations around that, I think, were, were quite a lot of fun inside the program. And um, the, the, but to come back to, uh, to um, the key question in a sort of conversation amongst Graham, Dominic, and Ingrid just now. We don't want to be 2024 London. We, we know that that context exists, and it produces different kinds of conditions that we think probably repeat in a wide variety of places. So when, when Dominic says north, south, east, west, 
I don't want to look at that as different kinds of borough regulations. I would kind of be wanting to understand uh, what are, how would we read the city differently uh, uh, around these sort of uh, these different parts of London, uh, such that there are different kinds of dynamics for urban areas, and, and that we want to use that as as a thought inspiration, rather than as something so so uh, strict and limiting that we have to be beholden to a particular regulatory environment. Now, having said that, I think we all recognize that sometimes regulatory environments can be a very useful tool for, uh, for driving, um, in a way, driving innovation, driving change. And we, we could perhaps consider how that would be included as, as a sort of component. But the, the emphasis, I think, was on so, so we've mentioned Neve Brown, uh, we've mentioned Dennis Lasden, and I, I know that a lot of what was driving Zainab's consideration of those um, intermediary maisonettes in the middle was not just EBEB itself, which is very deep, but was thinking, all right, well, what's the difference between EBEB and, say, Neve Brown's Winscombe Terrace? And how deep should these flats be? And if we wanted to be able to incorporate not only a domestic program, but some approach towards working life, how would that affect the depth? And how would I start to reason about that? So I think our, our questions are located more there, but we would still like to see how it might influence uh, wider conversations about the emergence of new actors and the development of policy, but not necessarily expecting the students to resolve that, but it's, it's a more collective argument, I think. I'm sure it's not true of every student, and I think every student has a particular emphasis. I mean, hand, you know, cards on the table, I'm very, I love utopian thinking, particularly within an, an educational environment. I think it's really important or else we go nowhere. I'm super interested in policy because I think good architecture and good architectural provocation has a capacity to target very specific aspects of policy for real change. Policy isn't set in stone. Policy is theoretically we're still a democracy and we have an impact on the way in which policy is made. And it, we only do that through demonstrating the, out, the potential outcome of those ideas. So I think that's tremendously powerful. I suppose that the question is not every project from my perspective can grasp historic typology in an effective and thorough way, as well as policy, as well as being utopian, as well as um, being entirely intuitive and speculative. And I'm kind of curious as the days gone on and perhaps as the years go on of how a thesis really demonstrates yeah, that set of priorities. I'm fascinated by the idea of the Barbican, not because it's the Barbican, but because it's an enclave. It's an enclave that sits into a bit of urban fabric in a way that actually you've, you've tried to make yours a landscape, when actually you wanted an enclave. And in a way, if you'd made it an enclave, you wouldn't have to deal with the terrace housing opposite or the Lee Valley. We create a very, very different context. And I think sometimes it's not utopian thinking, it's a kind of design stubbornness that can perhaps drive a degree of quite remarkable thinking that doesn't become compromised by mar the marriage of many, many different factors. And I know that within the world of practice and life, the marriage of many, many different factors is inevitable. But it's perhaps why, Graham, the, the projects that you'd like to do as live work maybe can't always happen in the real world. Well, we, I, think, I think the point we've just learned is that these conversations not only can go on, but need to go on uh, for, for much l longer. Uh, but uh, Zainab, thank you very much. It was inspirational for all of us as the start of a conversation. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.